Kia ora koto, ko Douglas Walker, Toko Ingwa. Um, we're here tonight with Andrew Sargent for a bit of uh, level three mechanics revision. Koto. I can see a number of you have already uh, put some pretty good puns in the chat. Um, if you would like to ask any questions during the presentation, pop them into chat. Andrew's really good at monitoring those as well, but I'll try and uh, deal with as many of them as I can um, so that Andrew can focus on delivering the, the information that he's got prepared. Um, just remains for me to say a massive thank you to Andrew. Um, Andrew is head of physics. So it's not quite the name of his role, but um, he's effectively um, that position for Takura. Um, and him and I worked for a number of years together at St. Patrick's College in Wellington. Um, so without further ado, um, I do need to say thank you to Study It, who have sponsored these webinars. Um, thank you, Andrew. Over to you. Cool. Uh, kia ora tato. Um, ko Andrew Sargent Takawunga. Um, as Doug mentioned, I'm the Kayaka Matua of Physics at uh, Te Kora. Um, I used, it used to be, that's what I was. Now I'm sort of Kayaka Matua of Science, but still the same thing. Um, so today we're obviously going to go over the mechanics exam. I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach to what I've previously done. Um, <clears throat> in the last year, I just did over, like I just did a full exam review. Um, this year, we'll probably do exam strategy for the first 15 minutes. Um, and then I'm still going to go over, I've got the 2013 uh, mechanics exam, simply because all the exams up from there have already been done. No point redoing what's already been done. Um, but I've written, I've pre-written some of my written answers. Um, and then I'm, I pre-wrote them. I've, I've just had COVID, so I had COVID on Wednesday, so my brain's a little bit foggy. I wrote them when I was a bit uh, elucid. Um, so then hopefully we can come back and I can sort of critique them. Um, and look at them from a different perspective, so you can sort of see from an, as an out, or yeah, from an outsider in view, um, sort of what you should be looking for. Right, I better quickly share my screen. Uh, I have to actually go full screen on this, don't I? Share screen. Uh, screen one. Try that. Um, cool. Um, yeah, and you can post in the chat if you've got questions. I posted up the top to uh, the link to the folder. Um, inside the folder is this slideshow that you should see in front of you now. I'm actually just going to chuck that slideshow in the chat. Um, I'll chuck that in there. Uh, <coughs> right, so I'll quickly make this full screen. There we go. Right, so... Um, some great resources. I thought I'd start off with that. So you've got Mr. W uh, Wibley's YouTube channel. Um, he's done last year's physics exams, I think the 2021s, and maybe down to the 2018. 20, his exam videos are awesome. Um, I didn't bother making the last year's exams because his ones are awesome and there's no point to double up. Um, he's also got notes for all the topics. Um, they're pretty much the same as the fold-out notes you can buy. Um, they're like, I don't know, maybe 20 bucks, or it used to be uh, a while ago. Um, and they're all color-coded. I highly rate them. Um, so if there's anything I sort of mention, you can go to those notes and you've got to find like a summarized version-ish. Um, uh, some of it's obviously quite summarized because they're just notes and not like the full explanation. So you probably want to refer back to your textbook. Um, I've got my channel, which is like all nice and organized. It's everything's like I'll put Mr. Wibby's videos on there as well. It's all like organized for level three. You can have a look at that. Um, there's a physics folder. That's what I put in the description of the video. So if you go into the description the video, you open it up, that'll take you to the year 13 physics folder, um, which you can like, that's where I've got all my resources. That's why this PowerPoint is found. Um, I've chucked in a simulator site, a circuit simulator, um, and then I'll put the link to Physics Realm as well. Um, physics Realm is just, it's just all the like level two and three and one in physics as well, I think. Um, yeah, it's in the description. It's literally someone, uh, led, and this is linked for the slideshow. It's literally right above you in the chat. Um, right, so it's not be waffling about this. So, exam uh, strategy. You should be sitting a minimum of two exams uh, prior to Thursday. So this coming Thursday um, <coughs> is obviously your exam. You should be sitting a minimum of two exams. Um, and you want to take what's called the KDR approach. So if any of you continue on in the aviation world um, and any of you want to be pilots, um, there's what's called a knowledge deficiency report. So if you sit any aviation exam, either in the PPL or the CPL, um, or in the ATPL, I think, as well. So they're all like the different pilot exams. Um, any question that you get wrong, you need to write like a mini report on it. Um, and that ensures that when you've sort of finished an exam, 
you've come away with 100% of the knowledge because, you know, as a pilot, you're not going to be up in the sky and think, ooh, you know, I only passed 80% of my test. I only need to, you know, I only know 80% of what I should be doing. We really need to know 100 So how that relates to physics, like sit an exam, any question that you get wrong, find out what topic it relates to because all, all the questions I've segmented up into their individual topics um, and then practice two or three uh, different versions or, like, different types of those same questions. You'll get what I mean very soon. Um, so that's that. Uh, historically, I went through all the last exams for the last, I don't know, seven or eight years to see whether like there was any trends in terms of excellence. Um, typically, it's usually C or D is the excellence question. Um, a is typically always the achieved question. The rest are either merit or excellence. Um, very, very occasionally, question B has been an excellence question. Um, but it's only been maybe sort of one out of every five years and maybe push and beat in there. Um, YouTube guides for questions that you're stuck on. If you are stuck, just use the YouTube videos. Um, the assessment schedules that NZQA post aren't always the full answer. A lot of the time they're not the full answer. There's often more that you could sort of write or add um, that the schedule doesn't put in. Also, the schedule is it doesn't it's not the annotated schedule that the actual examiners use to mark. So when examiners are marking your work, before they actually go and mark, they'll have what's called a panel meeting. So like any any paper might have ten markers. So all, all ten of them will go to a meeting. Um, they'll review maybe twenty exams and they'll have a look at the pre written exam schedule and they'll annotate any questions that might need clarification in the answers. So maybe I can't think of any of the particular. Um, no, I can actually. Um, so for waves, uh, level three waves, obviously, um, there's like one of the questions in terms of if you have like a diffraction grating um, and if you change the size of the diffraction grating, uh, often students will say, will, will liberal, like use a level two explanation, such as if the wavelength is related to the, the size of the slit, you get in greater diffraction. Um, not on the schedule, but what the like examiners will write down is like a clarification to say like that that's not acceptable and needs a different answer, etc. So yeah, a lot of the stuff on the schedule is not always there. Um, right, common excellence questions for level three mechanics. Uh, simple harmonic motion is like the excellence question for simple harmonic motion. They're always very similar. They're always got to use either you have to use this, the the SHA, SHM formulas. So um, either you be asked to find some position at some certain time. Um, you might be asked to find a velocity at a certain time um, or quite a good excellence question to ask um, is how far something has gone, um, how, far, how far something has swung. So I would definitely practice the SHM excellence questions uh, over the other excellence questions as like a priority uh, because they're usually more straightforward. Um, your the other like Kepler's law questions, um, sometimes they can be straightforward, sometimes not so much. Um, Right. Uh, so mechanics is split into your four, uh, it's like four sort of areas, not directly distinct. Um, we've got translational motion. <coughs> this is taken straight from the, um, the achievement standard. And notice I've highlighted uh, center of mass in two dimensions. It's been a long time um, since there's been a center of mass question that's relied, uh, which is asked for two dimensions, but it's in the standard, so it could be asked. And the only difference is you'll just get an X and a Y coordinate. Uh, like so you work out the center mass in the X position, and then you just do it completely separate in the Y position, and that would give you the two center of masses. So it's sort of like battle, battleships. You just have you know, two different uh, points that would line you up um, for that one. Uh, you've got conservation momentum. That can be in two dimensions as well, where you have to have conserved momentum in the X direction and conserved momentum in the Y direction or just horizontal and vertical. Um, <clears throat> it's limited to two dimensions. You're not going to get any three-dimensional stuff. Um, is it common for – I'm just reading the chat now. Is it common for excellence questions to ask about conservation of energy slash momentum? Yes, sort of, but not really. Not to the degree that scholarship – so if you, if you know about the scholarship questions, scholarship questions – uh, heavily rely on the knowledge of conservation of energy slash momentum, and they can do some, uh, yeah, you can have some very tricky algebra related to that. Um, not so much in level three. There's not really much further that you can go with it other than like a, a simple, <coughs> like a simple collision that's either at right angles 
um, where you've got like an exchange of impulse, but not the previous question. The, yeah, the previous exam questions in the last I don't know five years, most of them have only ever been merit. Um, nothing really higher than merit, so it's it's not that common if that's what you're asking for. Um, right, so circular motion and gravity. Um, you've got Kepler's law. Uh, if you want to know about that, look up the 2015. In fact, I could almost go th through the actual exam questions. Um, so translation mo uh, motion um, is fairly common. Uh, you can see here I've, I've gone through and categorised every single time a translation motion que question has been an exam. Um, you can see it was skipped out in 2015 and 16, um, and it was been in there ever since. You can see it's either A, A or B, um, sometimes C or D, A to C. Um, so I've been a bit lenient. Sometimes there's been a little bit of translation motion mixed in with some other stuff, um, but it's not usually mixed in that much. Um, it's usually just an achieved question. Um, I think the merit, yeah, from you got C to D, that's definitely a momentum and impulse question. Um, so you've got a, so I think question, this one here, 2018, is a good example of momentum in uh, two directions where it's coming at right angles. And you you have to use vectors to uh, to represent the momentum. You can't just use numbers because those vectors, then you add them up using uh, Pythagoras, um, and then you can find out like the total change of momentum. And then you can find out like, I think normally the, the two blocks will like stick together um, and then you have to use vectors and you add them together and find the, the final momentum and then you finals, find the final velocity. You're not normally asked for the angle, but sometimes you can be. Um, right, circular motion and gravity. Um, yeah, Kepler's law. This is usually always an excellence question. Excellence or like a, a moderately hard merit. Um, 20, oh, what did I do there? 2015, question one. Um, 1D is the actual derivation of Kepler's law, the full derivation. We had to work out like, the mass of the moon. Um, and I think you're only given the period of the moon. Um, yeah, and I think you're also given it in days, which is also tricky. So you need to be able to convert uh, different time scales as well. So you need to be able to convert days to seconds. So there's obviously 24 hours in a day, uh, 60 minutes an hour, and 60 seconds in a minute. Um, you times those three together, you get how many seconds in a day. And that's how you get like the period for like a moon if it's, if it's 30 days and around. Um, right, so yeah, these are all examples. Um, rotating systems. So this is the angular mechanic, uh, the angular kinematic equations um, with <coughs> angular momentum as well. So you've got torque, rotational inertia, um, conservation of angular momentum, and conservation of energy. There are often conservation of energy questions relating to uh, rotating systems, um, where 90% of the time, um, the rotational energy is not conserved, and the excellence question is realizing that when you pull your arms in, you're doing work. So if you're spinning around in a circle and you pull your arms in, you're doing work because you're like it's a force over a distance. Um, so that that's usually the one factor that separates um, students from getting merit to excellence, not realizing um, where this extra energy comes from. Um, right. SHM questions, you can see question three, question three, question three, question three, question three, question three. Yeah, it's pretty repetitive. Um, so that's, yeah, they're, they're pretty straight, not straightforward, but they're pretty uh, similar every single year. Um, right, so that is that for mechanics. Um, I think that's it. Yep, so what I'm going to do is we'll open up a mechanics, the 2013 mechanics exam. I'll go through and sort of, sort of show my approach to it. I just need to find where I put it. Where did I put it? It's up down here. Um, <coughs> right. Um, we'll open this up. And I need to hopefully change some settings. Uh, Hyperprint presented view. Sweet. So, yeah, so this is the 2013 exam. You can go into the folder um, to find it. Um, it's just in the exam, like I've, I've put it, it's in the folder, it's not hard to find. Um, right, so we have a hollow ball with mass of 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.310 kgs, the radius of 0 0.0340 meters. Um, it's thrown upwards, it rises through a height of 1.4 meters, then drops down again when it is released, it's moving upwards at 5.24 meters per second. So that's its linear velocity. Um, and you can see here, it's actually, um, 
given like the linear velocity. And it's also given you the angular uh, velocity as well. So it's given it in a weird form. It's given it in, as 2.7, uh, like zero oh dear, revolutions per second. And if you remember back to, uh, yeah, if you remember, I'm going to chat. If you remember back to uh, what is like what is the definition for frequency? The definition for frequency is how many cycles per second. Um, yeah, that, that's really it. So frequency is just how many cycles per second. Period is just how long it took something to rotate. Uh, full rotation. So that's rotations. Uh, no, that's yeah, rotation without an S in the end. Uh, per time. So that's normally like periods for things can be anywhere between uh, two seconds. Well, your class period, um, most most schools have a class period of an hour. That's an example of a period. Um, you're, all right. So this here is technically F and it's written in a confusing way. So it's really the frequency. Um, it, it could have been written as 2.7 hertz, but I've written it as 2.7 seconds, uh, 2 revolu uh, revolutions per second um, because I'm trying to confuse you. Um, <clears throat> it could also be written as um, it could be written as revolutions per minute um, or revolutions per hour, and then you just need to divide the whatever number. Um, so if it was 100 revolutions per minute, you just need to divide that by 60 to get to revolutions per second. So we'll go to the first question, show that the angular speed of the ball when it's released is 17 uh, radians per second. So in your formula sheet, you'll have a formula that is uh, the angular velocity is equal to 2 pi f. Um, so... We have the frequency, um, even though it's sort of convolutedly written. Um, that is going to be equal to 2 pi, um, and then we're going to have our frequency is 2.7. So multiply that by 2.7, and I'll see if my graphics calculator will overlay on top of this. It might actually do. Menu 1, and then we go uh, 2 shift pi uh, multiplied by 2.7. 2.7. Uh, equals and that's 16.9. I need to move my thing 966. So, because this is a show question, you must show the formula first. So, we have to have the formula. Oh, uh, no, um, you have to have the formula, then you have to have the working, and then you have to have the it always pays to have the un uh, is a calculator on radians. I don't actually know, it doesn't really matter at the moment because. Um, you, it only matters if your calculator is in radians if you're using the trigonometric functions. So if you're using sine or cos or tan, um, then your calculator needs to either be in radians if you're doing the simple harmonic motion um, parts or like part, uh, because you, obviously you'd be working in radians. <coughs> this is just simple arithmetic, so I don't actually need to worry. Um, so it should be 6, or it was 16.96. Um, and then I'll say radians per second, negative 1. So I give the full answer, obviously a bit neater than mine. Um, and then we obviously get the final answer and we'll write it down here. Uh, and then we have three SF, three SF, three SF, three, three significant figures. That's what I mean. Three, three, three. And there's four up here randomly, but whatever. Um, so we round that down to 17.0, um, 17.0 uh, radians per second, simply because that's what they've given it to us. How do I find whether 2.7, um, how do I get the 2.7? It's because it's given to us and it's given to us in a convoluted way and i think i hopefully already covered that um right b show that the average ooh, average acceleration our uh, angular acceleration of the ball before it was released um is 67.9 radians per second per second um so before it is released so it's probably it's from rest yeah vertically from rest so it started at rest <coughs> um this is probably going to be quite straightforward um, the angular acceleration is equal to the change in, or just go, um, I'll put change in angular velocity over the change in time. I know I've already got the change in time. Um, there it is there. I have the torque, though, but I don't have the rotational inertia. Do I have the, it's a hollow ball. Okay, so I could work out the rotational inertia. They haven't given you the um, rotational inertia's uh, formula. So if you haven't been given the rotational inertia formula, you're not actually expected to memorize this. So this is something in the formula sheet. Uh, and what I mean by that is the formula I is uh, proportional to, I'll put K 
um, here, even though this is not in the formula sheet and you won't be familiar with this, but m r squared. I'll put k because that k just refers to any uh, fraction. So for a, for like, a, um, yeah, i is equal to m, hold on, wait, m r squared, m v squared. I'm just looking at the chat. No, no, that's m v squared. This is a rotational inertia, so m, m r squared. Um, no, that, it's meant to be an R. I can see how that's a bit confusing. That's just super messy. That's just messy of me. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is a rotational inertia. Um, that K just re represents a fraction depending on the shape of the object. So in your textbook, you'll have a like a, a list of all the different shapes. Um, if it's a hollow ball, pretty – actually, I'm not sure. If, I think it's a hollow ball. It's two-fifths. Um, if it's, yeah, it, it all depends on the shape. You can look it up. There's like different formulas of all different shapes. Um, yeah, so you'd be given the fraction if you need it. So for this one here, because we're not given the fraction, we don't be, we could have used a rotational inertia formula. Um, torque is equal to the rotational, uh, the, uh, the angle of acceleration is equal to the torque multiplied by the rotational inertia. I'm pretty sure that is the uh, formula. I'd better just check that. Um, but I can guarantee you sooner or later we're going to have to use that formula. Um, ah, yes, that is correct. That's right. It's this one here. That's the one I was looking at. Um, let's move this out of the way. <coughs> right, so the change in angular velocity is just from 17 to 0 because um, it started at rest. So it's just going to be 17 uh, divided by, and the time is 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Uh, and that is going to be equal to, I'll just quickly open up my calculator. I can guarantee it's going to be equal to 60. Oh, hold on. Um, I'm going to divide this by 0.25. I do get 67.85, but this is probably enough. I'm just looking at this formula here. Um, there we go. That there, I could have blown up the change in angular velocity to, equal, uh, to be I, could have, I should have written that to uh, omega final minus omega initial and then divide that by the change in time. Um, that's probably what I should have had written that as. And then I should have gone 17 uh, minus uh, 0 divided by 0 0.25. Uh, and then you'd have, I'll write the answer that was there. Where was that answer? Uh, 675 so 67.85, I'm going to leave the units out to the very end, and then underneath you'll have the angular acceleration is equal to um, 67.9 rads per second squared. Uh, yeah, per second squared. Right, takeaway is show questions. You must show the formula, then you need to put the numbers in, then you need to calculate it out and then like write it finally. Otherwise, if you don't, if, if you miss any one of those steps, it's uh, not achieved. Um, right, calculate the rotational inertia of the ball. I sort of have already alluded to having to do that. Um, this is kind of this like writing up this question, this A and B will probably only be achieved. But they've written these, like they've written, if I was to write this question, you'd have to write those these two first parts so you can get to part C and have it be a merit question. Um, so we've got the torque is equal to the angular acceleration uh, multiplied by the rotational inertia. Um, so the rotational inertia is equal to the torque. Hold on, I've gone that backwards, haven't I? Quickly double check it. Um, yeah, no, that is right. Torque is equal to rotational inertia multiplied by the acceleration. Um, how do we know which inertia formula to use? They will either give it to you or it won't matter. And when I, mean, when I say it won't matter, um, if you have, let's say, an uh, angular momentum question, and say so you've got you've got two shapes and they'll always be identical shapes. So if you've got like a, 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 what was this? I think the 2015 or 2016 exam had a cat and it had the front of the cat rotating one way and it had the back of the cat rotating the other way. You didn't know the rotational inertia of the front of the cat or the back of the cat. It just told you that they were the same. So, or uh, that the front of the cat was modeled as a cylinder, the back of the cat was modeled as a cylinder. So, you just assumed they're both cylinders, sort of the same. And then, when you applied conservation of angular momentum to the front and the back, um, you had um, you had uh, I 
like the inertia of the front multiplied by the angular velocity of the front, and that is equal to the inertia of the uh, back multiplied by the angular velocity of the back. Um, just remembering that the angular momentum is equal to the rotational velocity multiplied by the uh, rotational inertia, uh, inertia, or the, the angular velocity or and the angular inertia, rotational inertia, um, same thing. So you can see here that if you had any fraction you know, of, the, of the inertias, that fraction would just be cancelled out. So whatever that fraction is at the front, they just divide both sides by that fraction and it would cancel out. So you wouldn't actually need to know what that fraction is. So this is an excellence concept. Um, where it just eventually cancels out. Um, right, so yeah, if you, if you want to have a better example of that, go to, I'm pretty sure it's a, either the 2000, I'm sure it's a 2016 or maybe it's a 2000, I think it's a 2015 question two, um, because I think that whole question was based on movies. Or, well, not movies, but like common uh, like themes at the time. I think uh, one of the questions was on Total Recall, which is a movie that probably none of you guys have any idea what it is. Um, one of the questions was on Smarter Every Day's video on cats. I think that's where it came from. Uh, and there was another one on, I think it was on gravity, but I'm not sure where that was originally from. Right, it's back to this question. Um, it's the torque divided by the angular uh, angular acceleration. Uh, we had the torque, it's somewhere here, uh, 0 0.48, 0 0.48. Uh, and we've got the angular acceleration, which is 67.9. Uh, and we'll just quickly work that out. Uh, I'll grab my calculator. Um, we had a quick chat. Um, he used the torque one where I would have used the fraction one. Okay, yeah. So because you don't know the shape of the object, well, you do. It's a ball. It's hollow. But they haven't given you the formula, so don't use it. Um, because I mean, you could, you could, if you've memorized them all. Um, I think actually in the mark schedule, um, it lets you away with it. Uh, notice that like every exam will have mistakes from the exam, well, from the writer. Um, and I'll go over the end when we have time, like writing approaches to what, how to approach writing an exam and what sort of mistakes you can sort of make if I, if I get time. Um, right, I'll clear that. I'll quickly work this out. So 0 0.48 uh, divided by 67.9. Uh, that should be delete, delete, 67.9. And that equals uh, 7.06. Oh, yeah, I'll go seven, uh, 7 .07. I'll just run that up. Um, oh. Damn it. 7.07i um, is equal to uh, times 10 to the negative 3, and it's rotational inertia. Um, so it's kg meters squared. Right, I better quickly check the chat. Um, nothing there at all. Um, I'll be hooked to check this answer. Um, Cathode rotational inertia of the ball. Talk over the angle of acceleration. Oh, I know what I went. I completely missed something. This is Newton's. It needs to be done. It needs to be torque. So this should be 0.48 multiplied by the radius. I didn't. There was there was a force and not the torque. Yeah, someone picked that up straight away. I just realised I'd done that. So it should be multiplied by 0 0.034. Um, Right. This seemed already very, very small. That's why I was a bit suspicious about that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I forgot to multiply by the force. <coughs> right. Let's just move on because we know I went wrong. But everything else was fine, and the rest of it is correct. If I um if I'd forgotten to, oh yeah, other than forgetting to multiply by the distance. Right. Um, for the following two situations, explain where the height of the ball. Uh, whether the height to which the ball rises will be less than, greater than, or the same as 0.14 metres, you ignore the effects of air resistance. Okay, the first example is a ball is not rotating, but given the same linear speed when it's released. So I can think of quite a few different ways I could ask the same question. So another way you could ask the same question is have a block, uh, like an ice block, being getting pushed and given like a, I don't know, a set amount of energy, maybe a spring. With, yeah, this would be a good question. Have a spring, give an ice block some energy, and it would shoot it up a ring. And you'd say it's no friction, no, yeah, no, no tricky stuff, no friction, whatever. Um, <clears throat> the block would just have purely linear 
kinetic energy. And as it moves up the ramp, that would just be directly translated to gravitational potential energy, um, forgetting about all the external forces, et cetera, because there's no friction. That's pretty much what this example is sort of asking. So if there's no rotational energy, um, more energy can be put into linear translational energy. Um, so it'll get higher. The ball will end up higher up. And I'm pretty sure I've written something like that. So I see when the ball is done at the same speed, we'll have the same linear kinetic energy as the previous example, thus we'll reach the same height as them. Do I want to wait? Ah, I didn't read this. Yeah. It's given the same linear speed. So this is me asking a completely different question. But if I was to write out a question similar to this, um, that's like another version of the same question that you could write. Yeah, so it's given the same linear speed, not the same linear energy. The next one's the same linear, linear energy, I'm pretty sure. Um, so it'll reach the same exact height because it's both shot up at the same speed. So it doesn't matter that it's rotating. Rotation doesn't really affect anything because there's no air resistance. It stays up here. Um, ignore the effect of air resistance. Um, one thing I didn't, so I just wrote this out without actually bothering to check the answer schedule, and then I checked the answer schedule, um, and I've highlighted a red thing I missed. So both balls experience a linear acceleration downwards of 9.8 meters per second per second. Um, the angular velocity of the ball uh, won't change. So I didn't put those things in there because I didn't really think it was important, um, but obviously it is. So it seems to be just writing out all the different things that affect the situation. So <coughs> obviously gravity is both going to affect them. Um, and so you want to just say gravity accelerates them both. Um, and you want to probably note that the rotational velocity of the ball or the angular velocity of the ball doesn't change. Um, next question, the ball solid instead of hollow has the same mass and radius, same amount of total work is given to the ball. It's linear and rotational. So solid instead of hollow, we instantly know that the rotational inertia is going to be greater um, because more mass is concentrated towards the center. Um, so that means the rotational inertia is going to be greater, which means it's probably going to be spun up with the same same amount of energy. Well, essentially, continue reading. The same amount of total work is done to give the ball its linear and rotational motion. It is the same angular speed. So if it's got the same angular speed, it'll mean it's going to have more angular or, or rotational kinetic energy um, than the previous setup. Um, moving at that same seed speed. So if it's got more rotational energy, it's going to have less linear translational energy or more less kinetic energy going straight upwards and more kinetic energy in its spin. Um, and I'm pretty sure, yeah, I put, as a ball is solid or a greater rotational inertia, as more mass is concentrated to the centre, so that's pretty much what, like, that was the first thought that you should be having when you read. Um, so when you sort of read these questions, answer the information given to you sequentially. So... They've said the ball is solid instead of hollow. That should be the first point that you address. Um, I have the same mass and radius, so that should be like the next point that you address. Um, is it uh, necessary to write down the actual formulas in the discussion to get a higher grade? Not really. I didn't in this here because I was using PowerPoint and I really couldn't be bothered using that add equation. And I couldn't be bothered trying to write my pen as well because I'm kind of messy. Um, but it will save you time probably. Um, it'll probably make your this, your explanation more succinct. Um, so I had to go about things in a bit of a roundabout way to explain it without having to bother to put the formulas in. Um, so I said, like, well, and I actually still put a formula in. I said, work done is equal to the rotational energy plus the linear kinetic energy. Uh, it's the same amount of work done uh, to give the ball the same egg. Uh, same amount of work is done to give the ball the same amount of angular speed. This means I should have a comma there. Um, this means the rotational energy will be greater than before. Um, which is true as the solid ball has less linear energy, it's linear uh, initial linear velocity will be less so it'll reach a uh, height less than 1.4 metres um, as linear kinetic energy is converted to gravitational potential energy. Um, things with these questions, if you get muddled between linear kinetic energy and rotational kinetic energy you'll you'll probably just get not achieved. You won't even lose marks. If you muddle those two things together, which is a really common thing to do, um, yeah, you'll just you'll just end up losing marks because that's that's what this whole question is trying to get you to do. It's trying to get you to distinguish the difference between things that spin and things that move, uh, like translationally or just, you know, in, in straight lines are completely separate. Um, in order to get something to move in a straight line, all we need to do is provide a, a force. In order to get something to spin, you must provide a torque. So, a big thing that I get with students when they're explaining angular momentum questions 
is they'll say, blah, 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 angular momentum is conserved, it's just no external forces. Um, and they've instantly gone from an excellence straight down to a merit or possibly a merit down to an achieved um, because angular momentum is only conserved if there's no external torques. You can have things that spin and you can move them around without changing how fast they spin. Um, spinning tops is an example of that. You can just move the board around um, and the top is translating through space, but it's not slowing down or speeding up. Um, so that is a big takeaway for that one there. <coughs> right, um, next question. Um, ball on the end of the cord, we've got 1.2 metres, mass balls, it's quarter of a kg. The ball is positioned shown in the diagram. Its speed is four metres per second. Um, calculate the size of the centripetal force acting on the ball, the instant shown in the diagram. So that's just application of the centripetal force formula. So you're probably not going to be given one of these anymore. Um, don't solid balls have less rotational inertia? Yes, yes, they do. Hold up. Solid balls have less rotational inertia. You're completely right. Did I completely muddle that up? I probably did. I did. Yes, this is why I shouldn't have been doing this when I had COVID. Um, <laughs> so now I'm looking at it. The rotation, the the solid ball actually have less rotational inertia because the mass is moved towards the center. So this is actually backwards. Um, it should be less. It should be less, which would hold on. The ball is solid and centered hollow. The same amount of total work does get ball. So this whole question, I'm pretty sure, is backwards to what I had written. I'm going to triple check that. Yes, it is. It's completely opposite to what I've written. Yeah, this is what happens when I write when I have COVID. Um, I write thinking the question is something different. So this this question would work if I uh, had paid attention to the fact that ball solid. So it's, yeah, it's the, everything I've said here should be the opposite. So it will have more rotation, uh, the solid ball will have less rotational inertia because more mass is closer to the center. <coughs> that means less energy will go to having a rotational energy um, and then it'll end up yeah, reaching a higher height. There we go. So this is what happens if I write when I'm sick. And I think, yeah, Doug has put in the formula uh, two-fifths for a solid sphere, um, two-thirds for a hollow. Yeah, so a hollow sphere actually has, oh, hold on, two-fifths for a solid sphere. Yeah, you don't know that. Well, you're right. It's um because uh, the hollow sphere has more rotational inertia. I should have paid, paid attention to that. Um, I have no idea what I was going on about. Right. Um, hopefully that has cleared up that question, and you can see where people go wrong. Right. Um, next part. This. We'll just quickly do this now. F C is equal to m v squared over r. This is just level two. Um, we're going to have what is the mass? Zero point two five. 0.25. It's not a show question, so you actually need to show your work and you can just put the answer. Um, times 4 squared, um, and we'll divide that by 1.2. And I'll quickly speed run this. Can I quickly do this? Um, clear. Uh, 0.25 times 4 squared uh, equals divided by 1.2. 1.2 equals 3.3 meters. Ah, 3.3 newtons. 3, 3.33 newtons. And you can see I've just popped out that other answer. Um, explain why the ball moves fastest at the bottom of the circle. Um, I don't like this question simply because in the real world, you're like acting a force on it the whole time. Um, so this is kind of a confusing, it's a confusing thing to ask when you relate this to the real world. Um, in terms of physics, so, it's going to be fast at the bottom because all the gravitational potential energy that it would have had is going to be converted to kinetic. Um, that, that's as simple as that. Um, we've got question C. Diagram which shows the gravitational force acting the ball at the top of swing. Assuming the tension force is non-zero at all points, fill the vectors to show the relative size of the tension forces top and bottom. Um, using the same scale, draw the centripetal force um, on diagram two um, at these two positions. Right, so <clears throat> we need to see if it's going at a constant speed the whole way around. Um, ooh, relative size of the tension force top and bottom. Okay, so 
a really hard excellence question that can be asked with this, with regard to this, is if you swing something in a, ooh, if you swing something in a, in a vertical circle, but you say it's moving at a constant speed. So this is, it's, it's mathematically easy to say. Uh, for Tibi, you can link there. There is more tension FC, so there's more speed. Yeah, you sort of can. Um, probably not the answer they're looking for um, because, yeah, so what I'm trying to get, get to now is you not you could you could write up a question that's a little bit imaginary such that you just say it's somehow held at a constant speed all the way around. Maybe if a rigid rod. So a rigid rod, um, it's kept at a constant speed all the way around. Um, and at the top, uh, there's no tension in the rod, um, which means at the bottom, the tension ends up being double gravity. Uh, later on, when you get to some uh, simple harmonic motion, um, I'll sort of explain that a little bit better. Um, right, so at the bottom of the swing, the tension force obviously has to be greater than the gravitational force. Um, so the net force, when these two add together, still points towards the centre. Um, shows gravitational force in the top of the bottom. Assuming the tension force is non-zero, at all points, draw the vectors show the relative size of tension forces at the top and the bottom. Um, okay, bottom of the swing. Using the, okay, so I actually, so bottom of the swing, and then the top of the swing, it's non-zero, so the tension force is non-zero, so maybe we'll make it, I don't know, um, make it maybe that big. doesn't have to say how big it needs to be. Um, just It just means it needs to be non-zero. Um, right. Using the same scale, drawing the centripetal force on diagram two at these two positions. Hold on. Ah, centripetal force at these two positions. So the centripetal force is obviously going to be smaller than the tension force. Oh, this is a good question. Smaller than the, cent uh, than the tension force because obviously you've got these two vectors uh, like add together, so one subtracts from the other. Um, so you would just make that slightly smaller. You'd use a ruler as well, uh, and you'd label that FC. Uh, or you could label it FNet. Either or is probably fine. I uh, would call this FT, uh, and you can call that FT. And then here, they'll add together, so maybe slightly bigger than gravity, but, but not by much. Um, and you'd try and get a ruler to try and measure that out. Um, and that is FC uh, as well. One thing to note FC at the bottom should, well, yeah, it should be bigger than FC at the top because it's going to be moving faster at the bottom. Um, and that's just the way this question is set up. So this is actually quite a trickly con uh, like constructed question um, and the fact that the ball's changing speed throughout the loop uh, in terms of the vectors. So this C could actually be, uh, is FC the same size at the bottom? Uh, same size at the bottom, the same is T at the top? No. So the centripetal force, oh, hold on. No, it's not. It shouldn't be because the speed is changing. So the, the speed moves fastest at the bottom. So that means the centripetal force will be, yeah, will be, yeah, it's a good question. So that, this, what, this is what makes us a very hard question because the, the speed is changing. So that means uh, the net force or the centripetal force it's going to be changing as well. Yeah, so this is this is like a diabolical question with, with a lot of pitfalls. Um, I think this has been asked quite a few times, but the speed's get, being kept constant. Um, and what I was trying to relate before is if the speed's kept constant and the uh, force of gravity is just the, the force at the top and there's no other forces acting and that's what's, what's keeping it in uh, like circular motion, that means at the bottom of the loop, uh, it'll be exactly 2G because you're – the size of the centripetal force will be the same all the way around. What's the difference between FR and FT? I'm not sure what you mean by FR. I think they're meant to be both FT, uh, FT, if tension force, and that's meant to be tension force. Probably just me being super messy. Um, they're both, this, this here is meant to be a tension force, and that is meant to be a tension force. I'm just trying to write them up. Yeah, it's just my writing. Um, right. Show the minimum speed the ball must have during circular motion is 3.43 meters per second at the top. Um, so at the top, the minimum speed is when gravity, when the, when the force of gravity is acting as the centripetal force. If the centripetal force um, formula, or if, if that is less than gravity, then gravity will have a component which will actually accelerate the ball off the loop um, and then it'll detach. So that's, that's one thing to sort of consider. So basically, we just have it at the top. Um, we have FG is equal to FC, 
Um, and then we just got mg mass times gravity is equal to the uh, centripetal force formula, mv squared over r, a little bit messy. We can cancel out the masses, just divide both sides by m. Um, we can move the radius up and under. So we have gr, and that would be equal to v squared, um, but we'll just square root by, or put, make that equal to v squared. That should be a squared, by the way. And then we have v is equal to square root um, gr, and then from there, we just go square root uh, 9.81, move that square along, multiply by the radius was 1.2, um, and that is going to be equal to, I'll quickly do that on the calculator, because we do have a little bit of time, we've got 15 minutes, we don't have that much time at all. Um, shift, square root, shift, answer, uh, no, I've got bracket, complete, uh, bracket, and we're going to go 9.81, multiply by uh, 1.2, 1.2, bracket, uh, 3.43, there we go, 3, oh, no, let me move this up, uh, 3.43 uh, metres per second, negative 1. Um, so explain your answer. So I'm not going to write it um, just because I want to save myself some time, but the reason for that is at the top, the only force acting is the force of gravity. Thus, we can say uh, the gravitational force is the centripetal force, um, and then yeah, we'll, we can just equate the two together like we've just done. Um, Right, well, last question. We'll try and work through this with a bit of speed. The ball drops to, a minimum, to its minimum speed, uh, 3.43 at the top. Using conservation of energy, show the angle at which the tangential speed of the ball uh, is 4 metres per second. So we're just trying to figure out, it's 4 metres per second here. Um, from, the top, like from the top, what's the angle? Um, so we're going to be using conservation of energy because that's really all we've got. Um, so it's lost gravitational potential um, and it's gained kinetic. So we're just going to write, uh, it's like gravitational potential, mgh, is equal to the kinetic energy gain. So it's going to be half um, m, and instead of saying v, uh, you've got a final velocity and an initial velocity, we're just trying to find that change in energy. Um, so we can just put this in brackets, uh, v squared minus uh, initial v squared. So it's the final, square v, uh, final velocity squared minus initial velocity squared. Um, as you can see, we can sort of cancel out the masses, so just cancel out. Uh, we're trying to rearrange. How do you handle the vector diagrams with an object on a slope? I can't figure out which angle should be which in the vector diagrams. Um, typically, I know what you mean. Um, <clears throat> typically, the angle is always. You just look at the picture. Like look at it. It'll always give a really small angle. Um, that's, that's how I describe this. Yeah. Normally, they always give the yeah. Pra Doug's right. Practice. Um, Normally, like the, the diagram will give it away when you like move the triangle around, um, and the angle is usually always real small, and it makes it obvious if you just look at it and go, "Oh, that's the smaller side of the triangle, or that's the small side." Um, that would be the small angle, um, right? So we'll quickly, h is going to be equal to um, bracket v f squared minus v i squared bracket, and this will divide by uh, g, and then we can just I'm not going to put the numbers in, or we'll just do it on my calculator. Um, where is my calculator? Um, right. Um, uh, final is four squared minus three point four three squared bracket divided by nine point eight one um, equals zero point four three. So this is zero point four three meters. Yes, must be. Hold on. That doesn't seem right, does it? Have I done something wrong? Uh, but I need to. No, that seems about right. That surely I'm gonna quickly check myself. I feel like I've, um, I feel like I've made a mistake somewhere. Have I made a mistake? Where have I made a mistake? That doesn't seem right. Um. Oh, the half. I left the half out. That's why. I knew I made a mistake somewhere. Um, that half should still be there. So there should be a half here. So it should be 0.43 divided by 2, which gives me 0 0.215. There we go. Uh, 0 0.215. I'll quickly do my calculator. Um, so, yeah, I can just divide that by 2. Um, reason why I was wondering, that's a bit suspicious. 
43 centimeters, the, the whole radius of the of the circle is 1.2. So when you're doing these questions, have a good look at like the the picture and see if it physically makes sense because these questions are written to physically make sense. Um, going down 0.43 is going down quite a significant amount when you look at the picture. So the picture kind of gives it away. Um, uh, so there should be 215. Two, uh, it should be 215. Um, and then we have a, this is height here. It's H, that's the adjacent. We have the hypotenuse. Uh, do we have the hypotenuse? Yes, that's the hypotenuse because this is the right angle here. Um, so we've got adjacent hypotenuse when you use cos. Um, so we say theta is equal to cos inverse. Um, and we need to do this in degrees. So it's the opposite, which is going to be uh, always. 0 0.215 uh, divided by 1.2. Uh, and that is going to be equal to, if I could grab my calculator. Oh, we don't have much time to go. Um, if we clear that, uh, shift, cause, oh no, clear that, shift, cause, uh, go 0 0.215 divided by, oh, delete, divided by 1.2, shift setup, change this back to degrees. Exit, uh, there we go, 79 point. Um, that was, I think you've got your, uh, you've got your 0.215, it should be 0.7 something. Oh, no, wait. 0.215? Do that again. I have 1.2 minus 0 0.2155. On the numerator divided by 1.2 on the denominator. Oh, uh, cos 0.215 divided by 1.2. Opposite divided by, are they adjacent divided by the hypotenuse? That seems right. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's the adjacent, that's the hypotenuse. What is going on here? That doesn't seem right at all. What's going on? Oh, you're right, you're right. It should be 1.2 minus, you're right. I completely missed that. Um, yeah, it should just be 1. Uh, yeah, I know what you mean, Doug. I completely see. Um, I still do have brain fade at the moment. That should be uh, 9, 9, I guess. Um, 34 degrees, there we go. 30, 34, uh, point, what was that? Point something. Um, 34.4. Point four degrees. Yeah, so I had worked out the, the height that it dropped. Um, pays, so, yeah, the reason why I made the mistake is because I didn't annotate my diagram. So when you're doing these, always annotate your diagram um, so you can sort of follow what you're doing along. Um, right, so uh, question A, this is a show question. So this is just a, like a show where you've got to put the numbers in, um, and, and this is a pendulum. So the pendulum formula is always right in full. T is equal to 2 pi uh, square root L over G. L over G, you need to substitute in the values. Um, so, yeah, just need to put it in. So 2 pi square root uh, 1.2 over 9.8. It's a show question, so you've got to have the, you got to have that, and then you've got to have the answer. I'm not going to put it in because we're running out of time. Uh, explain what must be done to ensure the motion of the ball approximates uh, some ball motion. So this is not a very commonly asked question. Typically, it's always what is the definition of simple harmonic, simple harmonic motion to some degree. And the definition is, in order to have something undergo simple harmonic motion, there needs to be a restoring force that's linearly proportional to displacement. So what I mean by that is a spring, as you move the spring away, the restoring force is linearly proportional to displacement. So the formula is F is proportional to negative Kx. Um, so springs will always, for the most part, undergo simple harmonic, simple harmonic motion. If you have like a bungee jumper, it jumps off. When the bungee's under tension, then you've got a spring force. As soon as a bungee sort of like comes up and then is in free fall, then it cannot be considered under simple harmonic motion because the force of gravity is the same. It's the same like force wherever you are in space. Um, so that is the best counter example I can think of or the best sort of analogy to explain what is not simple harmonic motion and what is. So you need to like dedicate this to memory. It's pretty much always a question A, maybe a question B. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe question B, but it's always usually just an achieved question. Um, right, so I just put in, there you go. Oh, so for, for pendulums, the ball needs to be swinging less than 10 degrees because if it swings more than that, it starts getting close to free fall. And when it's under free fall, not a constant force, 
So yeah, it needs to be distant 10 degrees. Also, when you derive the uh, pendulum formula, use a small angle approximation. So that you're also there. So small angle approximation. Uh, what sorts of questions do we need to discuss? <coughs> uh, energy. I can think of rotational and vertical, circular transformations, oscillations. How will we discuss translational motion in terms of energy? You don't really. Um, no, nah, you wouldn't. Typically for translational motion questions, I'd be looking at like velocities of center of mass. Um, they wouldn't really. Um, and if you had a whole bunch of things moving around, um, that's more of a scholarship question that you'd ask. Um, so if you, have, if you have like a whole bunch of particles, a center of mass question, that's more like a scholarship question. Right, uh, access below, what happens to the ball's total energy? It just fades away, um, like so. So it doesn't, it's not a linear drop. Um, you just need to remove the shape. So it's an exponential decay. A lot of things in physics are all exponential, exponential decays. Um, the friction force is one of them. <coughs> right. Um, is it possible to get it swinging back and forth? Hold on, wait. Um, swinging by holding the top of the cord gently and shaking it back and forth. Explain how shading the top end of the cord can make the ball at the bottom called oscillate and symbol harmonic motion. So this is a resonance question, um, secretly sort of hidden in there. Um, it's it's asking you how do things oscillate, essentially that. It's asking you how do things oscillate, um, and, the, and the, the way to answer this question is you just need to say you need to drive it at its resonant frequency. Um, so I'm pretty sure in, in order to get the ball to oscillate and symbol harmonic motion, you must swing the core back and forth at its resonant frequency. Um, you can maybe put in brackets the driving frequency must be the resonant frequency. Uh, this will cause the amplitude to build up, oh dear, the amplitude to build up and make the oscillations visible. So if you don't drive something at its, at its resonant frequency, um, it'll still wiggle, but the amplitudes won't build up. Um, yeah, and when you drive the quarter resonant frequency, the kinetic energy of your hand is providing energy to the system. Um, and then the ball will cycle from uh, gravitational potential to kinetic at the bottom. I don't know if I need to put that in there. I just chucked it in there because why not? Because I asked about energy transfer. So it asked about energy transfer, so I just put in all the energy transfer that's in there. Um, last question. Uh, simple, harmonic, simple harmonic motion requires a restoring force. It changes in proportion to the size of the displacement. Okay, so that given the definition sort of, um, you just need to put in that it's linearly proportional to the size of the displacement, um, and it's negative. So if the displacement's one way, then the force needs to be the other way. Um, yeah, the reason and frequency is the same as the natural frequency. They're just synonyms. They mean the same thing. Um, Right, so discuss what provides a restoring force when the ball is swinging in simple harmonic motion. Um, and your answer should describe all forces acting on the ball. Explain how the forces change as the ball swings, draw vectors to show how the restoring force is produced. So the only forces acting on the ball are tension. Uh, well, look, start off with gravity. Gravity is the, the thing that causes all the forces to happen. Without gravity, you wouldn't have tension because there'd be nothing pulling on the string. <clears throat> so the ball experiences the force of gravity. Thus, there is a tension force to uh, obviously oppose that force of gravity because the string's not going to break. Um, when it's stationary by like just sitting there, they will be equal. When it's moving at the bottom, if it's moving, it's changing direction because it was going from, it was once at the top going down, now it's coming back up. So it's accelerating. Um, anything that's accelerating obviously has a net force greater than zero. So the tension force at the bottom must be greater than the gravitational force, has to be. As it moves up to uh, like this position here, the tension force has a vertical component which counteracts the force of gravity, and it also has a component that points into the uh, page. You can sort of break it down however you like, um, not into the page. It, it uh, points back the equilibrium, um, like I like I've drawn in there. Um, there's yeah, there are quite a few ways you can sort of break it up, but it doesn't really matter that much. Um, as long as you sort of draw like I've done there, and you can say that at the top here, uh, you've got a force downwards of gravity, because gravity never disappears, it's always there. So I've said the only forces acting on the ball are gravi uh, gravity and tension force of the swing. Um, force of gravity is constant for the higher swing it is. Um, however, the tension force, the, uh, tension force the ball, uh, depends on the ball's position. Um, at the bottom of the swing, the tension force under the greatest is a ball con considered undergoing circular motion. I thought I'd chuck that in there just because it is. Um, at the bottom, it's changing direction. You could probably, you could use a circular motion formula to work out the tension in the ball. Um, the net force is non-zero, so it's changing direction, accelerating, yeah. At this point, uh, gravitational, yeah, FG directly opposes the tension force, so the tension force um, 
must be large to the non-zero force. Um, so the only thing that I miss is you need to draw vectors of how this produces. You're going to have FG down here, um, and then you'd have obviously FT here, um, larger. Um, at the top here, you'd have, okay, I can probably just get rid of that. Um, that's just the component of tension that balances gravity. So you'd have that force up like so. Um, that tension force doesn't actually need to be the same size vertically as a gravitational force because it's actually the ball's moving under its own inertia so it's decelerating downwards so you've got a bit sort of going on there um do we need to draw a vector diagram to support the answer yes yes you do um you need to have a component of the tension force pointing back down um towards equilibrium to show that there is a restoring force uh, going on um right so that is the end of that um is tension force and gravity force smaller as the angle increases? Um, so obviously the gravitational force never changes. Um, the tension force should decrease. Yes, it will decrease as the velocity decreases. Um, so as, a, as it moves up, the tension force uh, should decrease. And then you've got components of gravity that are pulling down, which hold on. Yeah, it decreases to a point. Is actually kind of a, I don't think they'd ask that in level three because that's actually kind of complicated. Does a horizontal component of the tension provide the restoring force? Yes, yes, it does. Um, so in that case, the tension force would remain the same. Yeah, I'm not actually sure. I don't think they could ask that in level three. I think that that's a scholarship idea. Um, that's like above. I don't have to have a good thing about that. Doug, have you got anything to say on that? I need to, um, my brain is fried to try and um, think that one through. Yeah, sorry, I was just just trying to type my answer. Um, off the top of my head, I would have said that tension would increase as the angle between vertical and the string increases. Hmm. It's going to have to provide a a vertical component. But the, but the ball is moving under its own inertia, so it doesn't actually need to provide a vertical, vertical component because gravity is slowing it down. So as it moves up, gravity starts playing a, a, an effect um, on the ball to decelerate it, um, moving upwards, obviously. And then there'll be a, a tension force. There'll be a horizontal component. Well, not, a, not as a horizontal component, a component uh, perpendicular to the string, which acts as a restoring force to bring the ball back in. Um, yeah, there's no way they'd ever ask you that Um because that, that's getting that's bordering into deriving the actual equation. Um, and to derive the actual equation, you've either got to do a little bit of algebra wizardry, um, or you've got to use calculus, um, or you can use Lagrangians. Um, but that's like well above the scope of, of level three. Um, right, so we've got maybe two minutes, Doug, because we've got another stream running. Um, do you reckon we have time to quickly go over something? Too late. Um, so this is an example of actually exam I wrote uh, a year ago, uh, and why I wrote the questions I wrote. So when you're writing, like, so I thought I'd just do simple on ocean questions for us, for like, because the, the scene is the hardest. Um, first question is always like a sort of a show question. So I want students to either show a spring formula. Um, I'd give them one value, and they have to like show another value. Um, so you need to be able to rearrange the the pendulum formula or the spring formula um, because it's a really Good question to ask. It's like a starter, and it's always usually achieved. Um, you can see here I've put question B. State the conditions required for serious motion to be considered simple harmonic motion. I've, that's also a super common question. It's a good one to ask because um, it's one of the takeaways you want your students to like leave when they when they've like done simple harmonic motion. They need to know the definition of it. Um, that's probably I think I've left that as an achieved. I think A was a merit. Uh, C is a an energy decay um, sort of question um, where they've got to draw the, the frequency decaying away. And what I'm looking for here is students knowing that the period of an object, or the, the frequency of, of an object, just depends, for, for a pendulum, it just depends on the length. For a spring, it just depends on the spring constant. No other, like, friction won't change the period at all. And that's, that's what I'm looking for because it's somewhat counterintuitive. Um, and then the last question, um, where you've got something that's released, 
um, where you have to use one of the, the trick functions to find out like where like where it's moved to. Um, right. So I think the Doug Chunk summon chair. Um, yeah. Right. So I think we're going to have to make that do. Um, Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, just I was just sketching a little diagram of the tension and uh, weight question, and I think yeah, I think you're right that the essentially it's not going to matter for level three physics, but uh, as a little exercise, I think the tension is greatest, like you said, in its central position um, of the pendulum. Um, but that was a really cool question I had to think about for a little bit. Um, massive thank you for your time and effort in putting this together, and for the link to the resources that you've shared. Um, in the description um, and uh, if you've got any other questions that you haven't had a chance to ask students um, then please do head over to study it and pop the questions in there and we'll get those answered before your exam all right um, best wishes for your exam thanks again Andrew uh, we'll catch you next time Kakite. Kakite.